basic conclusion is this. The more you pursue a spiritual right, well, those people. If you want to follow along this morning, we're going to be in Romans, the 14th chapter. We're going to pick up where Micah left off last week. He did the first 12 verses. We're going to take verses 13 down through verse 23. And I will have them up on the screen, but I'm not going to be reading all the verses. That's why it might be helpful if you want to follow along in your own text. Before we get into this, though, would you uh, take just a moment, bow your heads with me out of respect to God as we draw our attentions to Him and pray together. Our, our gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God. It just, it just overwhelms us to stretch our minds to think of who you are, let alone the fact that you're our Father and we have a relationship with you. This morning in particular, as we gather together as your people, I'm just, I'm just reminded of the promise that you've made to us, that your word thoroughly equips us for every good work. And I, I pray we realize that a little bit more with the different challenges and things that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And God, I'm, I'm, I'm always <coughs> thinking about how we represent you in the world. But today I'm asking that you help us focus a little bit more on how we relate to one another within the family. God, I, I pray that our relationships will be the kind that encourage, that just bring out the best and help further develop each other, our talents, our abilities, and who we are in our relationship with you, so that we become the kind of people that just when people see us are going to be drawn to you. God, would you help us with that? Would you help us better understand, be convicted, and, and maybe <coughs> gain a little more wisdom on how we can help one another today? That's my prayer, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Uh, Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 13, it starts off the very first page and says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And you recognize this uh, transitional statement or this key word ties it in with what he's just been saying. So it's very important for us to remember a little bit of what Michael was talking about last week. If you, in your Bible, go back up to verse 12, one of the last statements it makes is, Each one of us has to stand before the judgment seat of God. Right? In fact, if you went back up in verse 10 and 11 and 12, it's talking about the fact that each of us has to give an account for the way we live our lives. We are going to be judged. There is a judgment day. Right? After saying that, then he says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. This verse, by the way, in my estimation, this verse and verse 23 are the two key verses to really Really kind of wrap your mind around it, and I think, I think we will glean the most from this passage. That's why I really want to talk about this. Because there's a judgment day, because you and I have to give an account for the way we live according to what God has said. Because of that, let's stop passing judgment on one another. What's, what does that mean? Is he saying judgment or no judgment? Well, he's saying both. He's saying there is a judgment day, and what is that judgment day going to be all about? I don't have time to get into that, but let's just review Basically, it's going to be about what God has said, right? God has clearly said some things are right and some things are wrong. Those are the, I think Micah used the expression non-negotiables last week. What's a non-negotiable? What, what's one of those things that it's a hill to die on? It's, it's one of those things that, I'm sorry, it doesn't make any difference the way I feel about this. It doesn't make any difference the way you feel about this. This is just the way it is. But how do we define that? It's pretty easy. If God said it, that settles it. You know, when I was a young man, they used to have this statement. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know what the problem is with that statement? It doesn't make any difference if you believe it or not. <laughs> right? If God said it, then that settles it. In fact, that's, that's I think, part of the problem. I'm getting off track here again. So let me, get, let me get back to this. What are we talking about here? We are talking about what is right and what is wrong as defined by God. Those are the non-negotiables. Well, what about that area in between? Again, I think one of the expressions, a lot of people use this expression of the, the gray area. I want to I wanna use the term here that the Bible frequently uses. When it talks about things that God has not said, this is what you do, this is what I expect of you, and these are the do not do. You know, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder, don't lie, things like that, right? Everything else in between, the Bible uses this word freedom. Freedom. 
If God hasn't clearly said, this is what I want you to do, and this is what I want you to avoid, this is the yes, this is no. If he hasn't spoken on that, it is an area of freedom. And that is what this passage is all about. How do we handle our freedoms that we've got? And can, can I just say it this way? Stop making it more difficult for one another than it already is. Life's pretty tough sometimes. And God has already given us all the standards we need. You and I don't need to introduce more of those standards that God hasn't come up with into other people's lives. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. You have to put this verse in context. He is not saying, he's not saying if somebody has a different uh, attitude about lying, for example. He's not saying, well, don't put a stumbling block in front of somebody. You know, don't bring up that issue. No. No, you and I don't have the option of saying that's okay. Because God has already spoken about things like that. Those are the non-negotiables. What we are talking about here is God has already established what the non-negotiables are. Now, what about the areas of freedom? How do we handle those? Well, we've got to stop judging one another. A couple weeks ago, I was reading a book. And it talked about a young man named Eric. I think his last name was Stagno. I can't quite remember. I think that's it. But Eric, early 30s, up in Massachusetts, has a, had, had, I don't think he does anymore, but he had a membership at uh, Planet Fitness, at Planet Fitness up there. And he went in one day, and right behind, I don't know if this is true in every Planet Fitness, but uh, right behind the counter, they have this big poster on the wall that says, No Judgment Zone. And Eric decided to put it to the test. He came in. He sat down in his bag, and he took off every piece of clothing he had. Totally naked, he went over and picked up a yoga mat, and he laid it down and he started doing the stretches to get ready for his workout. Well, as soon as he did this, people behind the desk called 911. The cops were there pretty quickly. And according to the reporters who were talking about what happened that day, they said between the Snickers and everything else, the cops said, as they hauled him away in handcuffs, nothing but handcuffs. As they hauled him away in handcuffs, Reportedly, Eric said, I thought this was a no judgment zone. <laughs> right? Well, obviously, that's not what planet fitness means. Can, can, can I play off that a little bit? When God says stop judging one another, he's not saying there aren't any judgments to make. Let, let me just go a little bit further simply because I think this is so misunderstood. The classic passage is in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, the very first verse, a lot of people can kind of quote this or at least paraphrase it. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. That's kind of King James right there, right? But stop judging one another, right? And then he goes on to gives the illustration that a lot of people remember. Why are you concerned about the little speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own eye, right? But usually people stop right around that part of the discussion and they don't continue saying what Jesus goes on to say. What Jesus goes on to say is, go ahead and take the log out of your eye in order that you might do what? Take the speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, wait a minute. I, I thought we weren't supposed to judge people. What Jesus is, is saying there is you be careful how you judge. You know why? Because there are some things that we really do need to get in other people's lives, especially our brothers and sisters, if it's an issue that God has already talked about. If he said this is what you're supposed to be doing and we see a brother or sister who we really love, and hopefully we're developing this love, for our brothers and sisters, and they're not doing it in their life, somehow, some way, it's my responsibility to help you. Right? I'm not going to be able to do that if I've got a lot of issues in my life that I'm not working. I've got to get the logs out of my eyes so that I can help somebody else. But at the end of the day, if God has said something, those are non-negotiables. It's not what we're talking about. What are we talking about? We're talking about that area of freedom. Anything that God has not clearly spoken of. I'm going to give you a biblical example. And I'm going to give you a, a modern day example at the end to hopefully bring this all together. But let's read the rest of the verses here. In verse 14, he goes on and says, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. Can I, can I just say this without going into too much detail? He's talking about something that God has not talked about. God has not said you have to avoid this. He says, you know what? There's areas of freedom. It's not unclean. It's not going to get you in trouble with God. But... If anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. Okay, I think verse 23 is really going to help us understand this verse, but let's keep reading. He says in verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, one of the examples he's going to give, 
because what you eat, you're no longer after the love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ has died. Can I just say, the point he's making here is what you eat is a matter of freedom. And yet, you have to be careful the way you use your freedom because it can still have an impact on your brothers or sisters. Let's skip on down here. It says in verse 19, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace, to mutual edification, building up. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Again, just following his illustration here. He says all food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. What does that mean? Well, verse 23. Whoever, whoever doubts is condemned if they eat. Because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. I really think that that is a crucial concept to understand in this, in this whole issue that we're talking about. How we do with our freedom. What does it mean when it says everything that does not come from faith is sin? Well, what does the word faith mean? Faith simply means a trusting belief, right? So what are we talking about here? We are not, let's say it again, we're not talking about the things that God says you should do this. Or the things that God says you should not do. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about areas of, of freedom, right? What that means is these are things that are not sinful. You're free to do what you want to do. But if it's not a faith, what does faith mean? Trust and belief in God. If you're no longer trusting God, in fact, if you have, if you have some sort of weird idea that maybe God doesn't like what I'm going to do. But you say to yourself, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do it anyway. Even if it wasn't a sinful thing, you just made it into a sin. Does that make sense? Because as soon as you, can I say it this way? You rebelled. You rebelled in your mind. It may be something simple. It may be something that's, there's nothing wrong with it in and of itself at all. But if it causes you to rebel against God, you just turn it into a sin. Now, here's, here's a bigger context. In my life, when I deal with areas of freedom, the thing that I have to watch is, how is that influencing my brothers and sisters in Christ? Specifically, will it cause them to rebel against God? Because if it causes them to rebel, then I'm causing them to sin. Okay, let me give you a biblical example, and hopefully this will, this will, this will become, I hope, a lot, a lot clearer. And then I want to try to give you a modern day example, but it's really going to be difficult for me because by the very nature of what, we talk, what we're talking about here, let me just throw this out and see if this works. By the nature of what we're talking about here, it has to be an area of freedom. But for it to be what we're talking about here, people don't see it as a freedom. They see it as an actual sin, right? Does that make sense? Well, if not, hopefully it will in a little bit. Let me give you the biblical example. Romans, the 14th chapter, what we just, what we, the verses we just read, he's been talking about what you eat, and he specifically mentions eating meat. Well, he kind of he kind of glosses over it. He doesn't go into great detail. But over at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he goes into a lot of detail. And he uses the exact same example of eating meat. Which, by the way, I, I don't know how many vegetarians I've got in my audience today, and I, I, I really don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't want to eat meat, that's fine. That's fine. But here's the biblical example. Romans chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the whole second half of that chapter. The Bible gives a lot of literary real estate to this subject. It must be important to God. That's why I really want us to focus on this. And all three of those passages use this exact same illustration or example. And it's an example of eating meat. Over, over in the book of 1 Corinthians, so we'll get a little bit more details. Here's, here's what we find out. In that day, in the first century, a lot of the meat that was sold in the marketplace, especially at Corinth, but this would be in any major city, a lot of the meat that sold at the marketplace got there because some of the pagan temples, after they offered their sacrifices, had leftover meat. And they wanted to make a little extra money. So they sent it to the marketplace, and it would be put on sale there. And Paul specifically mentions this when he says, if you're at the marketplace, and you want to eat meat. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. That's fine. You want to be a vegetarian? That's okay. Right? But if you want to eat meat, that's okay too. And so if you find some meat at the marketplace, go ahead and buy the meat. Go ahead and eat the meat. 
You know, as a Christian, that eating meat does not defile you, doesn't make you unclean, doesn't get into you and your relationship with God. You know it's an area of freedom, right? But then Paul goes ahead and says, not everybody knows that. In fact, he gives us the example. There are some people who are brand new Christians, and in that culture, of some of them were involved in those worshiping at those pagan temples. And if they were involved in those pagan temples and they saw some of this sacrifice that took place, it really bothered them. It bothered them to the point that they thought anybody who buys that meat that came from that pagan temple, you're actually supporting or endorsing in some way what goes on in the pagan temple. So they thought it was very sinful, right? Okay, with that understanding, here's what Paul says. Really, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul, but here's what God tells us. He says, if you're eating meat and you understand it's an area of freedom, then go ahead and eat meat. But if your brother or sister sees it as a sin and they see you eating, got to take it a step further. And because they see you eating, they are tempted to eat the meat even though they think it's a sin. Then don't eat the meat. Did you catch the last part that I just said? You don't stop eating meat simply because somebody else doesn't like it. You don't stop eating meat simply because they're going to be offended by it. You stop eating the meat if it's going to actually cause them to sin. So in this scenario, somebody, somebody maybe loves to eat meat. But because of their background, they think as a Christian, I shouldn't do that anymore. But they see you eating meat. And they think to themselves, they don't think to themselves, well, it must be okay. What they think is they think to themselves, oh, well, Mark's eating steak. I'm just going to go ahead and eat some steak too. Even though I know it's wrong. Guess what? Did they commit a sin? They did because it's an act of rebellion for them. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. Let me give you a modern day example. And uh, I'll apologize in advance because I don't think this is an issue around here. I've known it to be an issue with different people at different places, some different cultures. And if somebody's watching online, uh, forgive me if I'm stepping on your toes here, but here's my example. Drinking coffee. I, as a Christian, I'm going to go on record and convince that drinking coffee is an area of freedom. If you don't want to drink coffee, that's fine. I think, as a Christian, John, aren't you glad to hear this? As a Christian, if you want to drink coffee, I think you're okay. I don't, I don't, I don't think you've sinned, right? But did you know that some people from different backgrounds actually think it's sinful to drink coffee? People I've known, it's been in different places, been quite some time ago, but some people I've known, the reasoning is this, uh, caffeine's a drug, coffee has caffeine, and Christians shouldn't introduce any kinds of drugs into their body. Therefore, drinking coffee would be sinful. Okay, if I know that I've got a new Christian, somebody who doesn't understand my freedom in Christ, and they have that attitude for drinking coffee, and they see me drinking coffee, what should I do? I should stop drinking coffee. If it's going to cause them to drink coffee. Not because they don't like it, not because they don't think I should, but if they've always loved coffee, but they gave up coffee when they became a Christian because they thought it was sinful, but oh, there's Mark drinking that delicious cup of coffee. I just can't resist anymore. I'm going I'm to go ahead and get some coffee and drink it too. Here's the example that Paul literally gives in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. He says, if somebody invites you over to eat, we're back to the illustration of eating meat again, right? He says, somebody invites you over and you're going to sit down to a delicious meal and they put meat in front of you. Here's what Paul says. Don't ask. Ask not for conscience sakes. Don't say a word. If it's meat and you have no problem eating meat, go ahead. Eat the meat. Enjoy it. But before, before you eat the meat, can, can you see the first bite ready to go? In my mouth? Before you eat the meat, if some brother or sister comes up to you and says, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark's the illustration. But they come up to you and they say, Mark, did you know that that meat was sacrificed to an idol over there? Zeus's temple or whatever. <coughs> as soon as they say that, you can read the room, right? 
You know what I mean by that? You can read the room. Why in the world would they have bothered to tell me that unless they thought they were warning me of something so that I could avoid a sin? He says, if somebody says that to you, then don't get to me. Does this make sense? Listen, there are three chapters in the New Testament devoted to this because helping develop our brothers and sisters and being loving towards them, even in areas of freedom where you and I have the right to do whatever we want to do, we willingly give that up because our brothers and sisters are that important to us. That attitude is important to God. I was rereading the, uh, the book I read a couple years ago, and I'm glad I was rereading it last month because I missed some things in this book, including a fascinating, to me anyway, a very fascinating interview. This interview took place between a man named Philip Yancey. I don't know if that name's familiar to him here. Nine years ago, he was an uh, editor for Christianity Today magazine. And several years ago, while he was the editor there, he had the opportunity to interview a World War II vet. A guy who saw time in the Allied forces overseas. And as a result of his experience in World War II, he decided to go into the ministry. This is not part of the story, but I, I just got to tell you, I just love that. So many people, when confronted with the issue of evil in the world, it seems as though they turn on God. You know, how can there be so much evil in the world? This guy had the sense to realize the reason there's so much evil in the world is because people don't have God. And because of what he saw in World War II, he thought, you know what I can do for the world? The best thing I can do is, is introduce him to God. Anyway, back to the story. He's, he's interviewing him as a minister now, but he's, he's wanting to know about the impact that his experience in World War II had upon his ministry. And so naturally they talked about some of the things that happened. He was, he was part of the Allied forces that were sent into Germany to do the cleanup after the concentration camps. And he said when they received their orders, they told them what to expect. And he said to a man, nobody believed it. They thought it was so overstated, just propaganda. How could it be that horrible? And to a man, the descriptions weren't bad enough. Just one story, he, he, he said a bunch, but one story. When he was sent to the first concentration camp, he was put on boxcar duty. What does that mean? They have these train cars, box cars, train cars. They opened them up and the corpses were packed in there like you would stack cords of firewood. The Nazis has meticulously laid one dead body with the head at that end and next to it, the next dead body with the head at this end so they could pack in the maximum number of corpses and then start with the second row and the third row until they just would fill box Well, one of the things the Allied forces needed to do was to identify for the next of kin everybody who had died in the concentration camp, so they were responsible for taking the bodies out of the boxcar. He says some of his buddies just couldn't do it. He said while he was in there unloading the corpses, some of the other guys were over by the fence just continually throwing up. He said he, he felt every emotion you could think of, pity, sympathy. The tears just came at times thinking about family members, thinking about what they must have experienced. But he said in the background, constant, with all the other emotions, there was this rage. How could evil get this to this degree? How could it? He also, he also commented on the fact that you would believe how incredibly light these bodies were. They were literally just bones covered with skin, so it was so easy just to pick them, gently, <clears throat> easily pick them up and take them out. But as they were unloading the boxcar, they soon discovered that not all the bodies in there were dead. They had taken their prisoners and had taken the corpses and piled them in there. Anybody they thought was close to that, they went ahead and just stuck them in there. <clears throat> And for however long they've been there, some of them had still survived. And so, of course, as soon as they found 
one of the bodies that wasn't dead, they called for the medics, they'd stay up all night, and they were actually able to resuscitate some of these people that had been stacked up, left for dead in a box car. Okay, the story goes downhill from there, but I'm going to stop right there because you already get the flavor of what this man experienced, right? Yancey, after hearing this and so much more that I haven't told you, kind of sits back, and, and I'm not going to get this right. I don't know the exact words that he uses. I'm filtering this. But he was thinking what I was thinking. And he asks this guy who's involved in ministry, he says, after seeing those horrendous sights, after actually experiencing that, how, how, as a minister, do you handle people coming in complaining about first world problems? You know, we're going to have to cut our vacation short. Why didn't God answer my prayers? You know, and Yancey was, in essence, saying, don't you feel like just slapping people, you know, when they, when they complain about stuff like that, when, when such horrendous things have happened and there's such... There's such a magnitude of evil out there that needs to be addressed. Anyway, I forget how Nancy said it, but that in essence is what he asked this minister now. And this is, this is just what humbled me to my core. Because the minister's response is, not at all. When people come in with the silliest complaints, with the trivial issues, it doesn't bother me at all. He says, you know why? Because I remind myself, Long before World War II, there was a young man named Adolf Hitler who was wandering around the streets of Vienna with some crazy ideas in his head. And if somebody would have just been patient with him, put their arm around him, and answered some stupid questions, maybe millions of lives would have been spared. Don't you appreciate that perspective? It may be an area of freedom. Maybe just coffee. What's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. It's a person. A person that Jesus died for. That we need to be careful with. Because you never know. But this one thing I do know. If I thumb my nose at them. I've not used my freedom. Who God intended me to. That's why I think it's so appropriate right now as we go into time of communion. Jesus said when we meet together, remember, remember that I died for you. That's why we take a little cup of juice, remind us of the blood, his death, and the bread to remind us of his life that he laid down. But when thinking about that, the Bible also tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you're supposed to look at yourself. You don't just say, thank you. Thank you for laying down your life for me. Can, can I ask you to look at yourself this way? Jesus was willing to lay down his life for you. Are you willing to give up something silly that's going to help out your brother or sister? Would you bow your heads? Would you pray? When you're ready, would you come to one of the tables?